Thank you, Faith. Faith. Wow. <laughs> oh, how he loves us. Hmm. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. God, thank you that you are a holy God. Thank you that you are a God who is not surprised. You're not up in heaven thinking, oh no, what do I do now? But you are still God. And God, I just pray that we would not ask why, but that we would look to you for leadership. We would look to you as the Holy One, the Sovereign One, the one we can always depend on, the one that doesn't change. And God, help us to revere your name as holy, as just, as powerful. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing the song, Holy, Holy, Holy. Uh, if you have the packet, we're going to do um, verses 1, verse 1 and verse 4. Father, it's our desire to be led by you and your spirit. Lord, that we would seek your kingdom in this time. That the gospel is not that, Lord. Help us to pursue your kingdom. Help us to be about one thing in this life. Lord, that we would be able to work together for that God, help us to have wisdom. How do you prioritize so that your kingdom comes first? And Lord, that we would be genuine followers of Jesus in our daily life. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to wait. Hold on, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Turning back, turning back. He 
turned upside down, Lord, you, you continue to provide our daily needs, and we are thankful for those, for the air that we breathe, for the water we're able to drink, or the food that we're able to eat this morning. We are thankful today to you, not the government, not, not our job. But we're thankful to you as the, as the source. And Father, we just truly desire to keep your eyes on you. Thank you. Amen. Mm-hmm. My life is in you. My life is in you. Greatest need that 
you met in our lives. And we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you that we can always come back to you. And you are always there to welcome us back. Thank you for your love for us. Help us to, to truly follow you and to trust you in this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Softly and tenderly, we're going to do verses 1 and 4. And just think about no matter where, where you are right now with Jesus, whether you're close or whether you're not so close or whether you're far away, no matter where we are, he's still a good shepherd and he's still calling us back. He doesn't hurt us, he leads us. Sing the song. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling for you. Father, thank you that you are our rock. You are our fortress. You are the one that isn't blown away by the wind. Lord, thank you that you fight our battles. That we don't have to. And Lord, thank you that we can be confident that in the end, in the end you win. There, there's no even, it's not even going to be a battle. It's not, a, it's not even fair. But you will overtake evil. So help us to rest in that. Help us to let you fight our battles. And to be strong in you, not strong in ourselves. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The heavenly armor. The armor of the winter, I don't belong to the world. The weapon that's fashioned against the swill stand, the battle belongs to the world. And we sing boldly, how honor, power, and strength to the Lord.
And let's sing the doxology. Great God from the blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all I wonder if the wind will blow my notes away. It might happen. <laughs> yeah. I'm worried about that. <laughs> it does say that the, the one who is led of the Spirit is like the wind. <laughs> Don't know where it comes from. Um. I, uh, I was thinking about, I wanted to talk today about treasure and about value. What are the things that are valuable? As I was thinking about that, um, it really seems like I'm, can I, can I come out from under there? <laughs> come out of the closet. Um, thanks, Marty. This could get blown over in the wind, but. Let me try this again. There we go. All better now. Um, as I was thinking about the, the idea of value, um, you know, we have, in America, it's a good thing we have holidays to remind us because we're forgetful. I don't know about you, but I'm very forgetful. And um, we have holidays, like recently we had Mother's Day and Father's Day to remind us people who are valuable to us, um, that we owe something to. Um, and I, I was just thinking about my, my young grandson, Malachi, who on Father's Day, he made me and his father, uh, my son, a Father's Day card, and he made it all colorful, and he scribbled on it, um, and so he was very proud, and he brought it up to us, and, and he first he brought it up to Lynn, and he said, Grandma, I wrote something on it. And of course she said, what did you write, Malachi? And she says, I don't know, I can't read. <laughs> and thinking about that, it's, I think that's a little bit my response sometimes, our response. We, we, <laughs> we lose our way <laughs> a little bit in remembering the things that are valuable and, and clearly understanding why are they valuable? What is valuable for us? As I was thinking about... Uh, that's a little bit bright, actually. <laughs> I'll figure this out. Yeah, I really will. That's better. Okay. Third time. The third time is the charm. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to get the sun off of my page there, if possible. Um, this will work, probably. No, this will work. This will work, I think. Um, I'm definitely losing my train of thought. Um, as I was thinking about, uh, you know, asking the Lord, what, what should I talk about what, what, for this message? Uh, and I, I was, then I, in a day or so, I read First Peter 1, 18 and 19. Let me read that to you. It says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from the forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ, 
And as I thought about that, I was thinking about, it says, the precious blood of Christ, we're redeemed with that. How, and I was just thinking, how, how valuable is the blood of Christ? How valuable is that? And when we talk about the blood of Christ, of course, that's really symbolic for the life of Christ, the life of God. Um, and lots of history with that, like and, and the Israelites and Passover day, remember the first Passover, they sprinkled the blood of a lamb over their door so the angel of death would spare their family. And death would not come, but there would be life still. And the we talk about the blood of the Lamb, we talk about the blood of Christ today, it's the life of Jesus that was that he gave for us, for you. Um, how valuable is his life? Well, he's God. Infant. He is the one who created the vast universe. He owns it all. He created us. How valuable is his life? Of course, it's, it's much more valuable than we can imagine. Um, we, we really can't logically think of how valuable his life is. How valuable he is. Um, and so I was thinking about that and treasure. And, and often that is our problem. We forget the value of our relationship with God. We forget the value unthinkable value of the God that we serve and who he is. Um, and so that, that begs a question for all of us, an important question, what is valuable to you? What are the things that are valuable for you? Um, I think I'll close that for now. Um, the things that are val our values, the things that are valuable for us, they form our passion, they direct our relationships, they determine your thoughts, your values, the things that are valuable to you are very important to who you are and to your life. They determine your identity. I want to... Um, Jesus actually addressed that greatly in, in Luke chapter 12. But let me just take a verse from that initially. In Luke 12, verse 34, Jesus said, I think one of the most profound things about life and humanity, he said, very simply, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that determines really the course of our life. The things that I hold dear, that are important to me, that's also where my heart will be. And it's a profound explanation of human behavior, too. When we invest in something, we, we put value, time, energy, money into something, it becomes valuable to us. Um, and we begin to love that thing. We, we're invested. And, and we really can't escape that. It's, um, it's our, part of our nature. So if you work hard, you save your money, you buy a new car, it'll be valuable to you. You'll be a little bit angry when somebody scratches the paint. If you invest in a person or a relationship, if you give to a person and love them and pray for them, you will love them. You will care about them. You cannot help it because you're invested in them. Sometimes we think the opposite. We think that if I love them and give to them, that they will love me back. They'll love me. That's not necessarily true always. Um, but you will love them because you have invested in them. It's is simply the law that Jesus set forth. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When you invest in something, you cannot help but love it and care about it. 
Um, and, and so in talking about that, that's, that's a very important concept for us. Scripture tells us Jesus, when asked, what is the most important commandment, remember, said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors and stuff. And so that gives us a little instruction on how to do that. But if you have your Bibles, please do turn with me to Luke chapter 12. Um, in this matter of value and treasure, Jesus be, he at length talks about these things in Luke chapter 12. Can't leave my Bible open. The wind keeps blowing it. Um, paper clips. Um, so starting in verse 13, a person uh, requests something of Jesus in the crowd. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And so it starts out, uh, a person is concerned about Who's going to get the money? Who's going to get the inheritance? And Jesus refuses to answer that. He refuses to be a part of that because his focus isn't inheritance, financial inheritance. But he does use that then as an opportunity in verse 15 and onward to talk about wealth and treasure. And in verse 15, then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possession. Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. Um, what is greed? Greed is where we, we want something that's valuable. And usually we want it for ourselves. Um, it says, be on guard against that, against greed, where you want things for yourself. I want to have it. I want to own it. Early in life, we've learned that things make us happy, or at least we think we learned that. We, we want more toys. Um, the bumper sticker, but he who has the most toys wins. Um, well, it's actually not true. And Jesus tells us to guard against that statement. A guard against that thought that my things will make me happy. He says, even when one has an abundance, not even when one has an abundance, does his life consist of his possessions. And my things, my possessions, cannot make me happy. They cannot give meaning to my life. And then Jesus continues in his teaching, and he tells a short story, or a, a, gives an analogy about wealth and treasure. And starting in verse 16... He told them a parable saying, the, man, the land of a, of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all of my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be met. And then verse 20. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? It's an interesting statement in Jesus' analogy. Um, 
in Jesus' analogy, God calls this person a fool, this farmer. Uh, why? Now, it says that he, his land is very productive. Is he a fool because his land is productive? No. Um, we have a few productive farmers here. Um, does he call him a fool because he wanted to build more barns? No. Um, probably not. It's not bad to be a productive farmer, and it's not bad to build barns to put my crops in and to put to store my uh, whatever my. But if, if I'm not a farmer, I could be anything to store my goods. In fact, I need to take care of those things. It's not bad even to invest my money for profit. So why, do, why is he a fool? Well, if you look at verse 19, it tells us his motivation. In verse 19, he's going to build the barns. He said, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. So, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with this thinking? It sounds like retirement in America. I'm thinking about that a little bit too. Um, what's wrong with that? Um, interesting thought. Well, you know, according to Apostle Paul, there's nothing wrong with that if there is no God. If there is no God. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, he says, What does it profit me if the dead are not raised? Let us eat, drink, and be merry. Or let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And what Paul is saying is, if the dead are not raised, if there is no heaven, if there is no God, God is not active among us, enjoy life. That's all there is. But in verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And he said, that's actually a lie because the dead are raised. There is a God and there is heaven. And our problem is that we want to build heaven here on earth. And we want to, like the rich farmer, we want to gather as much as we can so that we can make our life and our existence here like heaven. But the reality is, is heaven is not here. And we haven't arrived in heaven yet. Um, don't be deceived, Paul says. The, far, the rich farmer in Luke 12 was a fool because Jesus said in verse, uh, said he was investing, let me can skip up, you fool this very night uh, who will own what you prepared, so is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. The rich farmer was investing only in earthly riches. Um, he had the opportunity to use those riches to demonstrate his value for God, but he didn't do that. He invested it for his own riches. Um, in verse 21, the real problem is he stores up, so is the man who stores up treasure for himself. Stores up treasure for himself. It's all about me, for myself. Storing up treasure for my benefit. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to build my own kingdom. I'm going to trust in my wealth if I get in trouble. Uh, my money will get me out of trouble. And then Jesus said, for, for that man is not rich towards God. He has no true wealth with God. 
And in the next few verses, Jesus actually talks about what does that actually mean? What does it mean to be rich towards God? And um, and those two ideas are actually mutually exclusive. Storing up treasure for yourself and being rich toward God are mutually exclusive. You cannot do both. You have to choose what will you do. But then Jesus continues in verse 33. And um, uh, verse 22, I'm sorry. He says, he said to us this um, for this reason, and in saying that, he means because this is true, this is what you should do. So, and he gives us actually in the next few verses three <clears throat> steps or three things that we can do to be rich towards God. And right away in verse 22, he said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you shall eat or your body as you'll put on, for the life, for life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you um, than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life's span? If you then cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, they neither toil nor spin, but even Solomon in all of his glory clothed him, not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? And do not seek what you will eat, and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying, for all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. Verse 31, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Um, And you're all very familiar with that passage. I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, focusing on that, but the principle about riches that come from there is very simply, in verse... um, in verse 22, the first principle is stop worrying. If you're going to be rich towards God, stop worrying about things. Stop thinking about other things. We have to focus on the true riches, on God himself, and, and all that he has for us. Um, God feeds the birds. He clothes the flowers. He knows everything that we need. We don't have to think about those things. Stop worrying. Um, And the second thing, very simply, is in verse 31, seek seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Seek God first. The second step, stop worrying. First step, stop worrying. Second step, begin to seek God. Think about God and who he is. Begin to desire the things that God has for you in your life. What are those things? Look for those things. Think about those things. Pray to pray about those things. Talk about those things. Seek for those things and give God your full attention. We need to make, in talking about value, we need to make God our treasure, our first treasure, more than the earth, the worldly things of the simple things, possessions, food, houses. He needs to be our treasure. And we have to value relationships more. We need to value God's favor in our life. And we need to value his greatness and give him honor. Um, What is valuable for you? You know, Paul is a wonderful example of that. Um, We read in Philippians chapter 3, as Paul talks about his own commitment, He says, but whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value 
of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. That's a, that's a powerful statement for us. Um, what, what is most valuable for Paul? Knowing Christ. Being part of his kingdom is much, much more valuable to Paul than the worldly things, than riches, than the other things that he had, honor, respect from people. All of that was not valuable at all compared to knowing Christ. In fact, he said, in comparison to knowing Christ, everything I have is garbage. It's useless. It's worthless. Only knowing Christ and honoring Him. And as you read, uh, you know, Paul's story in Acts, Paul gave all of his energy to serving, honoring Christ, making Christ known. His life was an example of what he said, his, where his value was, which is Christ and know Christ. His most value. Paul's treasure was to know Christ. And then um, in verse 33 in Luke 12, uh, Jesus gives the third step. If you want to be rich towards God, then verse 33, he said, sell your possessions, give to charity, make for yourself money belts, which do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near, nor moth destroys. And sell your possessions, he says, and give to charity. Make for yourselves money belts that do not wear out. They're un an unfailing treasure. I like that phrase. An unfailing treasure. And you've noticed, we've learned, Earthly treasure never lasts. The things, no matter what it is, your car, your house, anything that's valuable to you on earth, it never lasts. It always depreciates. We can't keep it. Um, and yet, if we invest, if we're rich towards God, it's an unfailing treasure. Um, and we can give to people also, and that's, God says, Jesus says that that is also investing in his kingdom. Um, remember, Jesus said, when you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. Um, or he said, when you give, even, even give a child a, cold, a drink of cold water, you will not lose your reward. Um, we're called to invest in God's honor and in people's lives around us. And we talked about, I already mentioned verse 34, where your treasure is, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And when we invest in the kingdom of God and in his honor, it affects our heart. We begin to love God more. You'll have more passion for Christ and his purposes. And I would say to you, actually, if we don't, the third step of actually giving some of our physical uh, wealth, our physical, um, the things that God has given us, our blessings, if we don't invest some of those in the kingdom of God, you cannot, you will not love the kingdom of God and you won't be able to love God correctly or properly. Somehow that's tied together where your treasure is, your heart will be also. If you don't invest in the kingdom of God, you cannot love God. Um, it's a pretty important step. I think that we, we simply need to ask God what he wants us to give and how and who. Um, 
maybe other people aren't in the place to tell you what you should give, but you should give to God. If you don't give your physical, um, uh, uh, phys the things that God has given you, if you don't invest physical things in the kingdom, you can't love. You can't love God. And you can't have treasure in heaven. Um, that's pretty important. It's also true, one of the things about having treasure, being rich towards God, is that there are great blessings in that. We get to actually enjoy that. We are, You hear the phrase, you can't have your cake and eat it too. But actually when you invest treasure in God's kingdom, you can. Um, because in relationship with God, we get to enjoy his blessings and be invested for eternity. Um, Isaiah 55, great statement. We read in Isaiah 55, verses 1 to 3, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Come, why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. And God invites us to come. He says, why do you spend your wages for what does not satisfy? Come, delight yourself in abundance. And when we come and we invest in him, our energy, our resources, we experience God's abundance and blessing. Um, and it's also true just as much a blessing that when we invest in God's kingdom we have the opportunity and probably our only opportunity to be significant and I don't know about you but, but the longing in my heart there's always been a longing in my heart to be significant God make my life count I want to have some importance to my life somehow. And when we invest in God's kingdom, and when our treasure is in Christ, we need to be significant. Let me read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. For, for, God's, for God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. That's kind of a confusing statement, trying to sort out what he's actually saying. But he's shown his glory in us, in our hearts, he has given us the knowledge of his glory through Christ. Um, and then in verse 7, if you're a true believer, it says that God's glory actually shines out of you. He's shown his glory in our hearts. And then as a believer with other people, his glory shines out of us to them. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. The treasure of the glory of God, the presence of God, is in us, if you're a believer in Jesus, and you're an earthen vessel, um, a clay pot. Are clay pots valuable? Are they beautiful, necessarily? Usually not. In India, that's pretty common. You go buy tea in little clay jars, or they use a lot of clay pots, and then they just throw them away afterwards. Um, the vessel, the clay pot isn't valuable. But what's in the pot? He says, the glory of God. Inside of us, there's an unthinkable treasure. Um, I lost something here. <laughs>
by the Spirit, the wind of the Spirit. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, no, that still was the wind. Um, inside of us as clay pots is unthinkable, immeasurable treasure the presence and glory of God. Um, and, and you and I have the opportunity of sharing that with other people. Um, sharing hope. Sharing the presence of God. Sharing the treasure of God's kingdom. Um, that gives us significance. It's probably our only opportunity to have significance in this very big universe. We also read in 1 Peter chapter 2, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that's our purpose and our significance. We've been given a great treasure and we have the opportunity to share that with others. Um, I really need to finish. Let me just uh, finish with one more scripture. Um, and I think it's pretty significant. A very simple, Jesus tells a very simple one verse parable in Matthew thirteen forty four. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and he hit again. And from joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has and he buys that field. Simple, short parable. It's the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. It's hidden. What does the man do when he finds it? Well, he goes and sells all that he has. What motivates him to do that? Well, in the, in the passage, the verse, it says, from joy over it, he sells all that he has. Passion. Um, how important is our passion for the treasure that God has given us? How important is it? Our passion motivates us. I often think about that in India. Um, and pray, God, give me more passion for you, more love for you that I can't, that I can't hold back, that I have to share the good news of Jesus in every relationship. Our passion comes from our treasure. Where is our treasure? How great is the treasure that we have? Um, you know. When you, when, in India, when you share the gospel, uh, now we have mostly been called to Muslims, um, but we have opportunities with Hindus too. When you share the gospel with a Hindu person in India, they, they often are open to listen to that. Um, and sometimes they're willing to accept Jesus. The problem is they have a thousand other gods. And they just Put him on top of the pile. And that's not good enough. We read, of course, in Scripture that there is no other name given under heaven by which men might be saved, Acts chapter 4. Um, there's no other name. There is no other treasure. There is no other treasure than the treasure that God has given us in Jesus. Um, no other name under heaven. And um, uh, if you're a true believer, God shines out of you. Um, if you're a true believer, he wants others to see your treasure. In closing, you know, there's a lot happening in our world today. This year, maybe there's more changes in in history that we've ever, any of us have ever seen in our lives, especially in our country. The pandemic, riots, changing values, um, 
And we, it's easy to look at those things and get focused on those and think about those things and be afraid and to forget where the treasure is. What's important. Um, and I, I guess I, I just, in finishing the purpose, uh, the, the conclusion of my message today is that we cannot forget the treasure we've been entrusted with. How valuable it is. It should be all consuming. Remember Jesus' parable about the, the, the mustard seed, and it grows. And it becomes bigger than any tree in the garden. Um, and the kingdom of God should be like that for us. We cannot forget. Um, and I guess I want to sing, as we sing this last song, and as we close, I'll pray afterwards, but as we sing this last song, I just want to sing it as worship, declaring the value of God and his, uh, his gift and kindness to us and our relationship with him, the treasure that he is and he's given to us. Worship is declaring the worth of God. And we get to do that together. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you very much for the opportunity to be together and worship you, declaring your great worth. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you. And thank you for all that you do give us. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for, thank you for life. You are a great treasure. Thank you for the opportunity to be in a relationship with you, the God who created all the universe. Lord, we have no idea how, how privileged we are. Thank you for the great treasure you've entrusted to us. 
I pray God we're 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 forgetters. We forget everything, and we we forget quickly. And God, again, we pray that you'll constantly remind us of your great treasure. And we do pray, Father, that that for us that we will think about you as we as we go through the the steps of our lives every day, as we do the things we have to do on earth. Constantly, we ask, remind us through your Spirit of of our privilege to know you and the treasure that you are in our lives. God, I pray that we also would be able to reflect you to others. The most valuable thing we have is you. And we pray, God, that again, that we'll take the opportunity to share that with others, to be a blessing to others. Make us a blessing as your people. Again, today, we just thank you for the, the privilege it is to be together in Jesus' name too. And you've entrusted your treasure in us together as your church. We bless you and we thank you and we, we ask and pray these things in Jesus' great name. Amen. It is a great joy to be back with you. Um, not only from India, but just to be able to meet together. So have a wonderful Sunday. Um,